the title of my message this morning is finally at the North Face. Uh, you're going to go to the, the store and you're going to see the North Face uh, brand and you're going to be like, hey, uh, that message, you know, or when you're, wa- when you're mad at your wife and you have to uh, walk up a little distance because you don't want to walk with her and you're at the store pretending to shop because you just don't want to talk to her and you're going to see that North Face and it's going to break you out of that. <laughs> you're quiet because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but finally at the North Face. And, um, you know, before I begin, I want to I wanna really uh, say uh, it's a privilege to be up here. I want to thank Pastor Mike, uh, Pastor Rosie, you know, for this privilege of uh, continuing to, to let me uh, share the gospel. I want to thank all the pastors, you know, for uh, really investing your time. And not only that, but your exampleship really showing uh, living Christ out. I think now more than ever, we need examples of people that are... Uh, living Christ out and re- living out their right, true identity in Christ, amen. And uh, so before we begin, we're going to uh, say a word of prayer and then we'll get right into it, amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, God, for everything that you're doing here today, God. We thank you, God, and we're forever grateful for who you are. I pray that you'll seal this word into their minds and to their hearts, God, as they leave this place, God. I pray that you'll continue to They'll marinate on this word, Father, and continue to do great things within their life. We love you and thank you. And the campus says, and the campus says, amen. amen. You know, um, so if you weren't here the last time I spoke, we were ta- uh, the title of it was Turn North. And we were talking about the times that uh, Israel was in the desert for 40 years. And, uh, and they did not realize that they were in the promised land the whole time. And... Uh, And in the scripture, it was saying, turn north, which was when we soon discovered it was Jerusalem towards where Jesus was going to die many years later. And and it's awesome to see this because this is this second part. It's complementing what we what I spoke last time about how they got to where they needed to be. But it took 40 years to get there that a whole generation had to die so a new generation can live without mistake. And this is the after effect. They, they're entering into the promised land. They're, they're, uh, they're finally there. And then we really get to break down what happened when they were in the promised land, which is a crazy story, right? So our story begins in uh, Joshua 1-2. And uh, Joshua in this time is taking the place of Moses where as the, as the appointed one to lead Israel in the promised land now. So as we know that there was one generation that died because they um, continued to live in their bitterness, continued to live in their gossip, and continued to uh, live in their power. And, uh, and it's, it's crazy. So in Joshua 1-2, I believe um, as we go there, amen, it says like this. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. So at this time, Moses is dead. Joshua is now leading the people, and they have to cross over the Jordan River. As we know, uh, the Jordan, uh, salvation, right, meaning salvation in Hebrew. And, And it's crazy because... In this time, to understand truly what this story is talking about, you have to know the transition of leaders. So one, one Moses, and then Joshua. Joshua's name in Hebrew means the Savior, the Deliverer. And, and it's crazy because now they're leading with this generation, but the Savior is leading this generation. Amen? I want you to keep that in mind. Amen? Amen? But we're going to go to verse 7. We're going to skip through the story because it's a long story. And I really want to get to the, the meat of the story. It says, only be strong and very courageous. So God is giving them a task and uh, really speaking to Joshua. He says, uh, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, 
but you shall meditate in, in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So how many know that uh, we were never capable of fulfilling this law? But God is speaking to Joshua like he is capable. Isn't that crazy how there was 600, I believe, in 13 laws that man had to fulfill so they can be right in God's eyes? This was at this time. And, and, and they're in this position where it's saying, now God is telling him, don't let the book of the law leave your mouth. And he says, fulfill in everything that's in it. That's a hard task. Because every day, we have those struggles, right? We have these struggles of thoughts. We have struggles of different, a different mentality. Not everyone's mentality is the same. But it's crazy because he's saying, and if you don't know what the law is, it's the, the demands and orders for people to be right in God's eyes at that time. But how many know we're not living in those times no more? Amen? Thank, thank you, Jesus, because we were all going to hell at one time of our life. And thank you, Jesus, that we had a Savior, right? But what's awesome is that Joshua was not capable of fulfilling this, but God was speaking to him like he was capable. See, God wasn't speaking to Joshua the man. He was talking about the Savior. The Hebrew meaning is the Savior. See, this is a, just something very, something uh, that I want to really mention is that when you understand how to transition in thought, this is called the revelation, right? Revelation where you're seeing the Savior because the Savior was capable of fulfilling these laws. The Savior fulfilled those laws so we can live free in Christ. But you know what, what's crazy is that at this time, they're in the promised land, and God's telling them, you need to fulfill these laws. But, of course, talking about the Savior, that many years later, Jesus was going to fulfill these laws so we can live free in him. Amen? He was not capable of fulfilling this. He was not capable of, of doing, doing, I should say, doing what God had commanded. He was going to fail. He was going to fail in the promised land. But you know what's awesome? When we go to verse 13, is that it says that when the Savior fulfills these laws, you will have good success. So now that we're living in the future, back then, that God, God has said, you know what? I fulfilled these laws, past tense. Now we can live good, in good success. He's saying, I fulfilled this so you can live in good success, so you can be prosperous. So you can live free in him. See, that was the whole purpose of Christ, is that we were not capable, but he is capable. He is capable of doing all the things that we were not capable of doing. We always had the bad attitude. We always had the, the wrong ways of doing things. We were always going to fail, but thank God we had a Savior that seen us right in his eyes. In verse 13, it says, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and, and is giving you this land. So I want you to picture this. The frustration of 40 years in the desert. There's two generations walk, wandering in the desert for 40 years. And he's saying, you're finally at rest. You can finally, Right? but in him. And he says, because I'm giving you everything. You finally made it. You, you won the race. You, you, you finally crossed the finish line. And you're there. How many know that sometimes when we feel like we're always there, there's always something missing? You know, like you always get it right with your wife and you're finally not fighting. And then that one day you say, why do you always like to fight? We can't have one peaceful day. And it always feels like you're at the right spot, but there's always something missing. There's always something missing. There's something missing in, in people's lives. There's something missing where, where I just can't get it right. And you know what's awesome? You know what's awesome about this? Is that the Lord is giving them rest. But it just feels like they don't know how to rest. 
See, I want you to understand that it was the people in the desert, if we go to Exodus 19.8, is where the law began. It's where all the law began, where the, 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 main, the law began to, so that people can uh, ha- live in order. And in Exodus 19, it says, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, what does it say? We will do. See, it was never God's intent for you to do. It was always God's intent for him to do for you. That was the problem. And there, the law was introduced. Because now God had needed a plan because people felt like they had the power to do it. But look, I want to show you something. This, they will do, led them to death in the desert. But look it, if we could go to Joshua 1.16. I'm going to read a couple and then, and then we're going to get into it, Amen. Joshua 1.16, so they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us, we will do. And whatever you send us, we will go. At this very moment, a cycle is being repeated, and they don't know it. We saw the end of the story in Exodus. They all died in the desert. But now you're finally at the promised land, but you want to go with your power. See, this is why it's very important that you understand what you're speaking. Because you're, you might not feel the effect, but your children will. The people that are watching you will. It's important how you lead your life. It's important how you're not falling into your failures and, let, and sitting there. Because you might get over it. But guess what? The people that are watching you will not. See, we will do led them to you dying. We will do, and now you're, you're finally at the promised land. Imagine that. God gives you everything, everything that you can ask for, everything that you need, and you still want to go with your power. God gives you an awesome church. God gives you awesome leaders. Give you, God gives you an awesome environment, but yet you want to go with your power. This is why it's called routine. See, I want to talk about routine here. Because many people, especially in Christ today, and and people in Christ today, don't know how to live out of routine. See, it's routine that keeps you in bondage. It's routine that keeps you not wanting to circle in life and and get, get to a place where you need to be. And right here, A cycle is being repeated where now a routine is going to be created because they did not learn the first time. See, they hear the word of God, and many people hear the word of God, and many people understand what God is speaking. But because we don't listen the first time, we start repeating a cycle, and we start repeating frustration. We start fighting with the the people around us thinking that the whole world's the problem and not you. And we repeat the cycle where we're we're, we're frustrated, where we're not getting to where we need to be. But it's because we don't know how to listen the first time. You saw the mistakes of your, your father and mother, but why are you starting to look like them? Why are you starting to look like your environment? Because it's your environment that will shape your mentality. And when your mentality is shaped, it starts shaping your identity. This is why many people in the church today don't know who their identity is in Christ. Because they let their environment shape them. Well, I grew up like this. Well, I had no father. Well, I had no mother. It's a repeated cycle. And the enemy feeds on that. The enemy feeds on people that don't know how to break cycles. See, this is a repeated cycle, right? And, and guess what? And guess, what, guess where this led them? Back to slavery. See, many years later, they were going to, the Babylonians, they call it the Babylonian captivity. 
where the Babylonians were going to put the Jews back in captivity. But you know why? It's because they started repeating the cycle. It's like going, God bringing you through the, all this for you just to end up back in Egypt. See, this is the problem with today's people. The problem isn't that you don't know how to move forward. The problem is you don't know what the next steps are for you. You don't know what's ahead. You don't know what's to come. Why? Because we don't know who our father is. And when we don't know who our father is, we start knowing who our routine is. I, I, I go to work. I go to sleep. I kiss my wife goodnight. Go to work. Go to sleep. And then, and then because I like, because my wife makes me to go to church or my husband makes me to go to church, I'll go to church on Sunday. And just... Uh, where you start becoming a part of society when you weren't supposed to be of this world. See, this is, this is the powerful thing, is that even at this time, if you could bring it up, your life is like an exercise bike. Thinking that, Brother Joe, I don't know, I don't want you to stretch out your pants, but do you think you can uh, work it out a little bit? You don't have to, to go hard, but just go ahead. That's how our life sounds sometimes. You're just a nag. You know what? I'm sick and tired of always arguing with you. And guess what? You're not going nowhere. Real quick. You think you're going 10 steps ahead, but you're still at the same spot. Sometimes you always feel like you, you, you're accomplishing something because you get that awesome job. Oh, God finally gave me that job. But somehow it always takes you away from church. And oh, God gave me it, but it's dividing my family. And you're just in the same spot, frustrated. Same spot, frustrated, not knowing where I'm going, not knowing where, where life is taking me. But it's because you're, not, you're on the wrong, wrong exercise machine. People say, I, I, just, I just need to exercise, I just need to exercise my faith. I just need to, maybe if I, if I, I join the children's ministry, I'll be, uh, I'll be right with God in God's eyes. And guess what? After a while, Brother Joe is going to start sweating. If we were to paint a picture of many churches today on what they look like, it would be a lot of people that are sweating because they're frustrated with church, because they're tired of what church is doing, because of this, because of that, and you're frustrating yourself. Sitting in that seat, frustrated, sweating, because you're working out something that you are never meant to work out. Mm. You're in the same spot. This is why your wife keeps telling you, you never change. Yeah. And your husband tells you, well, you're just a nag. What? You're not showing anything. You're in the same spot. And this is the people in Joshua's generation. They're in the same exact spot. They're saying, man, we finally entered to happiness. Everything that we can have, everything that we can, we can uh, obtain, it's finally here. But why doesn't it feel like it? Why is it that I have the Holy Spirit, but I just can't feel it? Why is it that I, 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 I can smile outside and, and show a face, but when I get home, I show something different? Why is it that I'm, I'm always frustrated with life, with my job, with my wife, with my kids? I'm frustrated with everything that's going on in my life. It's because we don't know how to advance, but not advance on who you are. 
This is why it's important to advance in the gospel. Because when you advance in the gospel, you start building knowledge that you were never meant to stay here. You were never meant to do it, Joshua. The people. You were never meant to do it. It was my power that got you there. It was my power that, that put your wife, you and your wife back together, your, you and your husband back together. It was me that brought your children back. It was me. But why do you always feel like every time you accomplish something, yeah, I did that. Okay, then when you add, end up at a dead end, then you did that also. But we don't like to hear that part. I'll just deal with it when I get there. Okay, when you get there, guess what? You're leading your generation also. That's your kids. Are we always going to show what, what a father that doesn't love their family looks like? What a mother that always has something negative to say because that's her language? This is why she goes out with her friends to go just talk about her husband. This is society, the society that we live in today, that it creates negative thoughts to damage families because everyone is in this position. Have you ever went to the gym and there's a bunch of these bikes? And then there's certain gyms that have a screen in front of you to, to make you think for the full experience. And then it's like, the faster I go, oh, I'm going faster on the screen. But when all the lights are off, and when it, everything's off, you start looking at your environment saying, I'm in the same spot. I'm in the same exact spot. You know why? Because all the lights are off you. All the attention's not on you no more. Because people seek attention so they can feel satisfaction. That is the craving of this world today. Give me attention so I can be satisfied with my life finally. Because you don't know how to live in the promised land. See, the promised land was something that God has given to the people. So they can feel. Or so they, let me change to feel. So they can know who their God was. That he keeps his promises. This just shows that even in the promised land, you can still go through it. Even in the promised land. But that doesn't mean that God, and this is what the church language is. Oh, you're going through it. That means God's testing you. You just got to learn from this right now. God's trying to teach you something. I didn't know that when you take a test at school, it was so you can learn something from it. It was supposed to, so you can apply what you learned. That was the point of a test. Life is always going to test you. Why? Because there's an enemy out there that, that is seeking to devour. But it's not so you can, God can teach you something so you can, oh, my car broke down. God is teaching me a valuable lesson right now. No, that just means you need to put gas in your car. God's teaching me something. No. The times that you go through something and you feel like you're being tested, it's the time to apply what you have been learning, which is the gospel. See, the gospel advances you so you can, so all these tests that the world brings, you can ace. This is the language that church has created that damaged the people because every time that they go through it, they feel like God is doing it. And guess what? That's been many of our mentalities today. God killed my, my father. And we're going to keep it real today. God did this. God did that. you got to understand we live in a fallen world where there's many deaths, many diseases. But thank God that, there's, that is, this is not our final destination. Thank God that after all that's said and done, that he's going to want to keep take us up to be with the Father. That is the love of God. But we always see the damage. We always see the mistakes. We always see the cycle. 
and we die there. See, I want you to understand something. Unhealthy routines damage your view on a hope for a better future. I'm going to say that one more time. Unhealthy routines damage your view on how you see things on a hope for a better future. See, routines keep you out of the loop of what God's doing. You never know what God's trying to do. This is why you don't understand them. Be, because unhealthy routines changes your view where you lose hope that your family can get it together, that you can be restored with your wife or husband. It changes your hope. And guess what? God, God gives us the hope for a better future. But because we do not see that here, it damages our actions out. Where now we start acting out what we've been feeling here all these years. This is why have you ever noticed that when people leave with a bad taste in their mouth from somewhere, like a restaurant, let's say a restaurant, they're very quick to go on Yelp to leave a bad review because it left a bad taste in their mouth. But guess what? The word of God and God is not a bad restaurant. It's just you don't understand the quality that's been giving out. This is why, have you ever noticed when you go to an expensive restaurant, we don't always like the best, the food, but it's high value. Doesn't mean that everything that you're gonna taste is gonna be to your likeness, but that doesn't change the value of it. See, I'm saying that all to say this. A lot of the times we do not understand what God has been trying to do in our life or why our, le our life has been end up in this place. That does not change the, the quality or high value you have inside. You've made mistakes. You have many headaches because of all the mistakes that you've been thinking about. Many trials, many thoughts. But what if I was to tell you, even after all these trials and all these thoughts, you still have high value inside of you? It, isn't it unbelievable that God can still love a man and still give him a hope for a future after they try to put everything into their hands? But I want you to understand something, is that as they were going, as they were going, which this is how it looks like, you're going backwards, and you're still not going nowhere. You can't go backwards, forward, nowhere, because you're stationed. But as they're going, this generation is going, and they're saying, we're finally getting somewhere. I'm finally at my happy place. I'm finally where I need to be. But why does it feel like I'm not there yet? Why does it feel like every time I want to do something right, it's always wrong? Why does it feel like every time I come to church, I'm being more attacked? And that's real. Why does it feel like every time that we, me and my wife are always doing something great, there's always someone that has to ruin it? Your mentality is stationed. And God is wanting to break you out of this mentality that's kept you there for many years, 40 years, 50 years, 30 years, that has kept you there, saying, oh, I'm finally getting somewhere. I'm sorry, when the lights are off and everything's not on you no more, you're going to start realizing that you're at the same spot, Egypt. You're, you're, you're in, in captivity. You're caught up. And guess what? Today's generation, it's not Babylon cap captivating us. It's your mentality. Your mind has captivated many people, and you are in captivity thinking that you're advancing. You're in captivity thinking you're advancing. I saw a picture on the internet, and it was a man that was smiling, but there was a hole in his head, and it was a little man in jail. Many of you guys probably have seen that before. That is the mentality of many people. They have locked up because they put up walls because of past hurts. 
They have put up bars and iron because they don't want no one to come and damage them. See, past hurts always keeps you in the routine because it doesn't allow you to advance. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness is the one thing that keeps you here, always here, that you go to, you're in the shower, you're here, you're in bed, you're here, you're, you're at your job but, and you're doing your job, but you're here. You're here right now and you're still here. You're thinking about all the words that are being said. That's the power of the mind. That anything that I speak to you, you're going to. This is why it's important that you don't allow anything to come here. Because when it damages here, it damages here. Because you have to think something before you're, it speaks something. This is why many people don't know how to declare here. Because they're still here. They're still here. They're, they're still trying to go. I'm trying. Maybe I need to do it. That's what I need. Yeah. The Lord's speaking to me. I'm, I'm trying my hardest. I can't go nowhere. I'm behind the pulpit. I'm, I'm in the children's ministry. I'm, I'm over there in, in my job, but I'm barely making it in life. Don't have a dang dollar in my bank account. And no one understands me. No one understands my relationship with my wife. No one understands the frustration that I have against my children. No one understands who I am. And this is the, the Christian life today that people say, this is why many people don't like the church because they don't know how to break out of here because they play the victim mentality because this is what keeps you a victim. Thinking that everything's going wrong, but you're really just stationed. I'm speaking to someone here today, and the Lord says here today that you need to break out of this because this year is the year that your children might get saved, but if you don't break out of this, you're not going to be the hope. But this is the goodness of God, that even though Joshua's generation was here, I want to show you the hope. Let's go to Isaiah 44, 28. And it says like this. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. You know what the powerful thing is? Is that even though they were in this mentality that they were repeating a cycle, they ended up in captivity. But God sends a man named Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, which was the Persian king. Did not, the Bible says that he did not know God. He did not live the Christian lifestyle. He did not live the lifestyle that, that everyone wanted their king to be. Because you know how many people look at people's lives and says, no, your life's supposed to be like this. But we're all in the same boat. And God chooses a man named Cyrus. But let's go to the next verse, which is 45.1. This is the powerful thing. The next verse, 45.1. He's saying this. He says, my anointed. What is God doing calling an unholy man his anointed? Thus says the Lord of his anointed to Cyrus, whose hand I have held. He says, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. God sends a man named Cyrus to free the Jews out of captivity once and for all. See, the first man, which was Moses, led them so far, didn't even get to go into the promised land. But he led them so far because that's what man power can do. It can lead you so far, but yet so close, but you will not get there. Because guess what? There needed to be a man that was separated from all the politics, that doesn't know everything, that doesn't know everything that's going on. And guess what he says? 
I'm sending a, a man named Cyrus, his anointed. You know who Cyrus was in this position? It was a representation of Jesus, what he was going to do on the cross for a people for once and for all. Because the law could only do it so much. But once and for all, Cyrus says, I'm going to free the people because I honor what God's spoken. He says, I honor what God's spoken to me. God spoke to me to free these people. And that's what, and I need to put them back in their position because guess what, Israel? You have been in captivity so long because of your disobedience, because of your transgressions have led you to captivity. But he says, guess what? I'm going to free you and put you back into the promised land where you belong. That's what Jesus did on the cross for us. He says, you've been wandering in this world all this time. He says, why aren't you free no more? Why aren't you in the place that you need to be? And, and there needed to be a savior to come die on the cross to free us from captivity out of the enemy's hand. And he says, no longer you are the name of your situations. You are no longer the name of condemnation. You are no longer in the name of divorce. You are no longer in the name of, of separation. But guess what? I'm going to send a man named Jesus Christ to come in to free him out of captivity once and for all. That's what your Savior did for you. Once and for all. No longer you have to be captive to your thoughts. No longer you have to be captive to the way you think. But once and for all, Jesus did it all for you. The same way that he used unholy people like the tax collector. The same way he used all 12 disciples that were not doing right in their life. Is the same way that he used a man named Cyrus that was not doing anything in his life that was, that was uh, honoring to God. But guess, guess what? He was going to be a representation from Jesus to the people. From God to the people. He was going to be the mediator. So you can live free. So you don't have to be on this cycle no more. So you don't have to feel like your environment has damaged you. My job has damaged me. Growing up without a father has damaged me. Not having my parents in my life damaged me. Me feeling like I'm not a good mom or dad damaged me. Me having this mentality that I look at myself in the mirror and I always say, you are not good enough. It's damaged me because that's what condemnation does. It damages the person so they cannot advance. But you know what the beautiful thing is? In John 1.17, it says the law came through Moses, which was the first time. The law came through Moses' people the first time. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know why it was once and for all? Because grace and truth has hit the people. Where they no longer have to be enslaved by people that don't have a say-so in their life. What is the Babylonians doing in a part of the Israel's life? They have no part. And that has been the people today. You let anything come to your ears to convince you otherwise about God. You have let people in your life that has just damaged you. That has just damaged you. Where they turn you into someone that you were not supposed to be. And you're, you get damaged by your environment, by the people that you invite. Let me say that again, by that you invite. You have the power Jesus Christ has given you the power to do all things and all things in abundance. Jesus Christ has given you the power to break out of this routine that has kept you, that has kept you in, in captivity. See, Cyrus was a, a man that people has viewed as not good enough. 
And this is crazy because if you go back to Isaiah 45, 2, this is the promised scriptures of Victory Outreach. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. Next verse, I will give you the treasures out of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. God is giving this promise to a man that felt worthless, that people viewed worthless. He's saying, I'm going to cut the, you don't got to do anything. Because guess what? When you put your hands to it, it led you there. But I'm a a man named Cyrus that's going to break open. I'm going to send a man named Jesus that's going to break open all the bars and bondages that have kept you. I'm going to send a man named Jesus that's going to die on the cross so you no longer have to live in captivity to your mind. That people have damaged you, put you in the deserts for 40 years, for 40 more years. That put you through the storm. But he says, I'm going to send my son to die for you so you no longer have to be captive to this world. He says, I'm going to send a man named Jesus Christ that's going to free you and cut all the bars open. And he says, guess what? I'm going to give you the treasures out of darkness, the treasures that you have not discovered. You know what the treasures are today? They are his promises that many people do not have not discovered because they put them in the dark. He says, I don't know what this is. The Lord has healed you. The Lord has freed you. The Lord has given you everything that you need in life to prosper. I, this, this, this is a time for the church to start grabbing the treasures and start putting them in darkness, in hidden places, in hidden riches of secret places. That's how we felt many times. I know who I am, but I'm in darkness. You know what God was telling Cyrus is? Cyrus, the Babylonians used to hide treasure. They used to put treasure away. And he says, for everything that you've done for my people, everything that they have is yours. Imagine how the peop people are going to profit from this. They, they're not probably not going to get what Cyrus is going to get. But they're going to get something better. Their identity back as God's people. Too many times that the Israel has been put in captivity. One in Egypt and one with ba the Babylonians. I could imagine their mentality. Is this who we are? Is this who we were meant to be? You know why they ended up in Egypt the first place? Because they were prospering. And Pharaoh was mad at them. And he says, if I don't get control of them, then they're going to outgrow me. That is God's people here today. The enemy is afraid that you're going to prosper better than him, than what he's doing in the world. This is why he says to, advance, to, uh, to spread the gospel to many places. Because when you spread the gospel, and this is not just any gospel, the true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you spread Jesus Christ to the world, to your environment, to wherever you go, he says the, uh, your, the enemy gets afraid. You want to want, know why you're being attacked? It's because you know the good news. You know who Jesus is. And he's afraid that you're going to take captive of what he's gained. Stop being afraid to take your family back. Stop being afraid of what life has to give you. Life is always going to give you uh, consequences. Life is always going to give you punishments. God, life is always going to throw something your way. But you serve a God that does not care. He says, you, you, can, you can throw this at me. You can, you can put nails in my hands. You can put a crown of thorns on my head. But I know at the end of the day, I am the Prince of Peace. I know at the end of the day, I am a son of Jesus Christ. 
and that's all I need in life. I don't need the bike no more. My father has always taught me to ride the bike because no one's going to do it for you. Oh, you have to get this job because no one's going to do it for you. Oh, every time that, oh, you guess what? If you have to go get it because life's not going to give it to you. Why? He does not know my father because my father says, I have given you everything. I've given you a high inheritance so you can gain purpose in life. He says, I have given you everything. Don't fear my church. Don't fear anything that is thrown your way. But the Lord says here today that I have given you everything to conquer. He says, no more. No more captivity. No more frustration. The Lord says here today that this is the year to prosper. The enemy has kept the church in captivity from knowing who their father is. Our purpose is to share knowledge about him and only him. We don't want to go back to Egypt. We don't want to go back to captivity. We want to live in our promise. And our promise says that he is true to the end. And he will always be true to you. The Lord says in your household, Many of you are going to have to start changing the environment if you want to see your children blessed. Because the environment is starting to create, starting to create people that they were not supposed to be. Don't let your environment shape your mentality.